the president has now taken his seat. Let's cross over into the house to hear now what will follow. Item M, reading of the proclamation of the 49th session of parliament by the clerk of parliament. Proclamation under section 59.1 of the constitution. Whereas it is provided in section 59.1 of the constitution of the Republic of Malawi that a meeting of the National Assembly shall be heard at such place and time as the speaker shall in consultation with the president appoint and whereas it is expedient that a meeting of the national assembly be heard now therefore i lazarus mccarthy chakwera president of the republic of malawi do hereby proclaim and make it known that the first meeting of the National Assembly in the 49th session, being a new session of Parliament, has been appointed to commence in the Parliament Chamber, Lilongwe, at 10 a.m. on Friday, 4th September, 2020. Given under my hand and the public seal of the Republic of Malawi in Lilongwe, this fifth day of August, 2020. God bless our nation. Signed, Dr. Lazarus McCarthy Chakwera, President. leader of the house amene so ari nduna ya sachitetezo amene wanda Richard Chimwendo Banda atenga so pano statement imene imene ichatana kuti Business item B State of the National Address by His Excellency the President Dr. Lazarus McArthur Chakwela uh, from the Chair of State. Your Excellency Madam Monica Chakwela, First Lady of the Republic of Malawi. Right Honorable Dr. Silas Klaus Chilima, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi. Right Honorable Catherine Gotaniha, MP, Speaker of the National Assembly. Your Lordship, Honorable Andrew Nirenda SC, Chief Justice. Honorable Deputy Speakers, Honorable Leader of the House, Honorable Cabinet Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Justices of Appeal and Judges of the High Court, Honorable Leader of Opposition, Leaders of Political Parties <laughs> represented in Parliament, Honorable Members of Parliament, His Excellency Jorge David Gune, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, and heads of diplomatic missions. Mr. Zangazanga Chikosi, 
Secretary to the President and Cabinet, senior government officials, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Speaker, Malawi stands in the twilight hours between the receding gloom of a long dark night and the rising gloom <laughs> of a new day. In this time of transition, the providence of God and the profundity of Malawians have conspired to bestow on me the honor of representing you and this August House with a portrait of the state of our nation. Although I'm now a stranger here, having twice graced this body as a legislator, the miracle of my standing here as president is uniquely sobering. It is therefore right for me to express at the outset my thanks to Malawians for the singular honor of choosing me to address this 49th session of their parliament. Madam Speaker, my intent today is to tell you, along with all Malawians represented here, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. The truth is our most potent weapon for development, as well as our defense against false narratives often told about our country. For example, you may have heard it said that Malawi is a poor country, but we do, uh, we must reject this lie. Surely, my country, with $85 million in gold exported to the Middle East every year, is not poor. My country, with a freshwater lake and multiple rivers, capable of generating $100 million a year in revenue, is not poor. My country, with soils fertile enough to grow the food needed to end hunger for good is not poor. My country, home to the coffee-scented hills of Misuku and Chitipa, and the tea-covered plains of Satema and Chela, is not poor. My country, home to the silhouettes of zebras and elephants grazing against the backdrop of a golden sunset is not poor. No, Madam Speaker, as you will see, soon see from my diagnosis of what ails us, ours is not a poor country but an impoverished one. Ours is a country stripped of its God-given wealth and potential by syndicates of people in the public sector who exploit decades of bad govern government policies and practices to enrich themselves and their private sector accomplices. Ours is a country intentionally mismanaged to sustain and commodify a perpetual state of economic misery 
that affords certain entities, especially political parties and organizations, a reason of doubt or reason for being at the expense of Malawians. In short, the poverty of our people is man-made. which means it can and must be unmade. In the elections we just had, Malawians showed that they are tired of the human causes of their impoverishment. They are tired of electing people to public office who use public funds for personal enrichment, not public service. They are tired of the civil service of their own, but the rubble of unprofessional cronies who are neither civil nor service, of service. They are tired of parastatals run by incompetent boards and careless executives. They're tired of governance institutions driven by layers of wasteful bureaucracy. They are tired of paying the highest taxes in the Sadiq region only to see them wasted on pet projects that add no mileage to our pursuit of sustainable development goals. They are tired of parliament sessions that produce budget after budget to pay for status quo without changing it. They're tired of hospitals without care, schools without deaths, families without food, roads without tar, homes without electricity, communities without water, courts without justice, crops without markets, markets without capital, skills without jobs, jobs without wages, and wages without value. They are tired of the biting long winter of economic hibernation. For this reason, Madam Speaker, I have chosen to address you today under the theme Restoring warmth to the heart of Africa. <laughs> Covering my assessment of the state of the republic, the state of the citizens, the state of the economy, and the state of governance. The state of the republic. Madam Speaker. The framers of our Constitution conceived the Republic of Malawi as a sovereign state with the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature as its three arms of government. These arms are meant to have unique functions and comp complement each other with checks and balances, yet they fail far short of this ideal in practice. By way of diagnosis, my administration believes that the executive is too powerful, the judiciary is too underfunded, the legislature is too subservient, and all three are too corrupt. This is what Malawians elected me. This is what Malawians elected me to correct. the executive. To reform the executive, we have embarked on a full-scale orientation of the public sector to the pillars of my Super High Five agenda. Servant leadership, uniting Malawi, prospering together, ending corruption, and the rule of law. This will happen across the public sector over the next year, beginning with controlling officers, 
to promote and inculcate the public sector reforms necessary for mindset change and structural reform as a catalyst for achieving sustainable development goals. To first track this process, I have already put in place the key performance indicators for ensuring that I and my cabinet embody the super high five pillars by our example. As a case in point, my administration will foster a culture of civil leadership within the executive by proposing legislation to reduce those powers of the presidency that stifle development of our human capital, our governing institutions, and our citizens' supremacy. Similarly, to advance our agenda for uniting Malawians, my administration has created the Ministry of Civic Education and National Unity. Through this ministry, my administration is working on establishing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to complete the task left unfinished by the defunct National Compensation Bureau, or Tribunal. Within this ministry is also the establishment of a Malawi Peace Commission, supported by district peace committees in every district. This bold policy to recover together from the wounds we carry will require plenty of civic education. I am therefore delighted to report that within the past 40 days, the draft national civic education policy has been finalized and is ready to launch. This means the national this policy will be reviewed to align the two. Furthermore, as a government committed to help Malawians prosper together, my administration has a cabinet with the highest representation of women and young people in history. And as a demonstration of my commitment to ending corruption, we are making the Anti-Corruption Bureau fully independent and resourced to investigate and prosecute financial crimes. You will also be pleased to note, Madam Speaker, that in fulfillment of my promise to govern by the rule of law, I will appear before this session of Parliament three times to answer members' questions. The only president in Malawi's history to do so as required by the Constitution. In summary, when it comes to the pillars of the Super High Five agenda, we walk the talk. The judiciary. Madam Speaker, before I express my support of the judiciary's reform agenda, I have a request to make of this entire House. Please join me in applauding the justices of the High Court and the Supreme Court for earning Malawi high praise across the globe. <laughs> through, through their meticulous and transparent handling of the constitutional case on the disputed 2019 presidential election. Can we do that? Yeah. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to report of other innovative approaches to justice that the judiciary has undertaken. Below the Supreme Court, which now sits as a full bench of not less than seven justices of appeal, the following specialized divisions of the High Court have been created. The Criminal Division, 
civil division, commercial division, and revenue division. Consultations are underway to establish, to soon establish the probate and family division, as well as the financial crimes division to fast track the disposal of corruption cases. This necessitates increasing the number of judges of the High Court to support the new divisions. Clear a backlog of cases and ensure a fair distribution of work across the justice system. It also means improving both the number and distribution of courts across the country with the goal of uh, having senior registered, uh, resident magistrates in all 28 districts by the end of 2022. As a prelude to these common measures, 50 non-professional magistrates are presently being recruited to be deployed to satellite courts throughout the country. And a functional review of the proposed reforms is about to be completed. Madam Speaker, in view of all this, I wish to state categorically that my administration considers it unacceptable that the entire judiciary is always allocated less than 1% of the national budget. I therefore call upon this House to support my administration's measures to correct this and win fence the judiciary's funding. It is not right to expect the judiciary to be at the mercy of the executive for its finances, nor to operate without proper infrastructure, courtrooms, or offices. The judiciary has no opportunity to draft the budget or vote for its passage. So it is incumbent on this House to work with my administration ensuring that the judiciary, its officers, and its staff are well provided for. There can be no new Malawi unless our courts are able to administer justice without hindrance. All Malawians are equal under the law. No justice must so justice must never be the preserve of the rich and powerful. Whether one is a woman, child, person with disabilities, elderly, person with urbanism, victim of human trafficking, victim of domestic violence, a refugee, person living with HIV and AIDS, or internally displaced, justice must be accessible in an environment that is safe and free from corruption and intimidation. That is why I pledge before God and all Malawians to leave no stone unturned until a beautiful judiciary headquarters is constructed across this parliament building. The legislature. Madam Speaker, speaking of parliament, the legislature has a critical role in consolidating our democracy. Being a House of Representatives, it gives citizens the chance to participate in the governance process. During the year review, Parliament not only fulfilled its role by passing electoral reform bills as ordered by the Constitutional Court, it also publicly assessed the competence of members of the Electoral Commission. The fact that both acts reached a dead end upon submission to the office of the president justifies my resolve to propose legislat legislative amendments aimed at enhancing parliament's independence and reducing <laughs> and reducing the president's power to obstruct its functions. Despite all this, 
I congratulate you for registering the following gains during the difficult period in review. Passage of a resolution scheduling the first presidential election against all odds. Three plenary meetings which passed, tabled, and adopted several bills, committee reports, statutory reports, and delegation reports. 38 committee meetings which scrutinized government policies, projects, and expenditure. Operationalizing the primary budget office to provide technical support to members of parliament. Conducting orientation programs for political leadership in parliament and recruiting and training new staff to reduce the number of vacancies and improve service delivery in support of MPs, part of an ongoing effort to fill all vacancies in the year ahead. Madam Speaker, allow me to assure you and the members here of my administration's support in the implementation of the following innovations soon to be undertaken here at Parliament. Thank you. One, the development of the 2020-2025 Parliament of Malawi strategic plan to guide implementation of activities. Yeah, yeah. Two, the automation of both the Hansard transcription system and chamber voting system to address delays. Three, the establishment of parliament television and radio to improve public access to information about house activities. Four, the construction of new office blocks to increase committee rooms and offices for members of parliament and staff. And finally, the construction of 193 constituency offices to serve a permanent to serve to serve as permanent points of access for Malawians to reach their MPs. Let me also add that it has long been my view that we ought to have official residences for MPs within their constituencies to ensure that they are part of the communities they represent. My administration is therefore actively engaged investors to develop plans for this project and to expedite its commencement. State of the citizens. Madam Speaker, allow me to now report on the state of the citizens with a focus on the quality of services our people receive from the ministries of health, education, labor, lands, youth, gender, social welfare, and information. Health. Madam Speaker, my administration's vision for the health sector is to give all Malawians access to quality, equitable, and affordable health care through the universal health coverage. The following key innovations will be a focus in our approach. Maternal and child health. My administration will strive to meet the target of 350 deaths per 100,000 live births by 2022 and the Sustainable Development Goal target of 70 deaths per 100,000 live births by 20. And so my administration will implement a national strategic plan for the HIV response, which aims at 95, 95, 95 coverage targets for diagnosis, treatment, and viral suppression by 2025. Madam Speaker, I'm also pleased to report that my administration has recruited 76 nutritionists across the country 
to lead our efforts to eradicate all forms of malnutrition, to provide a legislative framework for these efforts, we will be tabling the Food and Nutrition Bill before this House very shortly. However, I recognize that good nutrition must be augmented by good immunization services, which is why there is one billion quarter for that in this budget. Even so, my administration's most daring goal is to eradicate malaria, and we will soon be launching the Zero Malaria Campaign to support community awareness. We are also extending the indoor residual spraying being implemented in Korakora and Mangochi, Tunkara Bay and Baraka, with a total budget of about 12.7 billion kwacha. Another disease we must win against as a nation is tuberculosis, which is why my administration has put in place measures to achieve the United Nations high-level meeting commitments by 2022. For us as a nation, these include treating 9,200 TB patients, including 14,100 children, and 1,286 multi-drug resistant patients, and putting 343,050 people on preventative therapy. Madam Speaker, it is important to my administration to ensure that the gains we have made against these diseases are not lost in the face of a new pandemic like COVID-19. In terms of the coronavirus itself, as of 12 hours ago, we had 5,593 cumulative confirmed cases, 1,904 active cases, 3,516 recoveries, and 175 deaths. To facilitate our response to COVID-19, the Treasury initially availed 2.4 billion quacha to the Ministry of Health to cover prevention and control measures, and a further 3.9 billion quacha for the procurement of essential personal protective equipment and the installation of a new oxygen plant at Kamuzu Central Hospital. In the 2020-2021 budget, we have allocated 1.3 billion kwacha to central hospitals and the ministry's headquarters, while 2.7 billion will go to district councils. Admittedly, these measures are part of our last line of defense against the pandemic. Our first being stronger community health systems. To that end, my administration is in the process of recruiting 1,600 health surveillance assistants. Similarly, we, are, we will strengthen community health infrastructure by constructing 900 health posts and accommodation for staff in hard to reach areas by 2022 which is one step towards our long-term goal to put health services within walking distance of every Malawian. <laughs> Education. Madam Speaker, obviously a healthy population by itself is not enough. We must develop the capacity of our citizens by giving them skills that are competitive in this fast-changing world. I believe that education is a catalyst for national development, so long as it is accessible and has quality. My administration is committed to ensuring that every child goes to school, stays in school, and finishes school. One way we will do this is by passing legislation and developing guidelines for implementing our manifesto promised to make primary school education compulsory. As the world forget, excuse me, as the world forges ahead into the future, 
we cannot afford to leave any child behind. I'm aware that many of the children in our country have no good school near them to attend. For that reason, it is the policy of my administration to ensure that all schools have modern classroom blocks, teaching and learning materials, and most importantly, qualified teachers. To push us toward this goal, we will speed up the completion of all new primary schools and classroom blocks. This includes 14 urban primary schools and over 500 classrooms currently under construction whose progress is at 60%. 13 community day schools at 35%. 100 laboratories and libraries nationwide whose progress is at 50%. 100 girls' hostels and many secondary schools under the Secondary Education Expansion Development SEED project. Regarding secondary schools in general, I manifesto promised to bring back the junior certificate of examinations. And now that we're here, it will be done. Also promised was the removal of the quota system. And I, I want to assure all Malawians that while the previous administration made sure that its quota system was gone, my administration will make sure it is dead. In the area of teacher education, my administration is assessing funding proposals for the construction of Inkosimbera University for the study of animal science, as well as the establishment of Kamuz University of Health Sciences and Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences. Meanwhile, my administration will increase enrollment in universities from 36,000 in the 2019-2020 academic year to nearly 48,000 in the 2020-2021 academic year. The construction of three teacher training houses, uh, colleges rather, for training primary school teachers in Mchinji, Rumpi, and Chikwawa will also be done in this coming year. Alongside the Masi College of Education with support from JICA. The training of teachers will also include 200 special needs teachers at Machinga Teacher Training College. More broadly though, I'm thrilled to announce that my administration is on course to open all COVID-19 compliant schools next week. <laughs> Labor and land. Madam Speaker, this roundup of focus areas in education naturally brings me to the subject of employment, without which our pursuit of the economic aspects of sustainable development goals would be rendered futile. It is no secret that Dr. Shilima and I promised to create one million jobs in our first year in office. To realize this, we have embarked on a job creation initiative and are treating the creation of a conducive environment for further job creation as an ongoing and multi-sectoral effort. We are currently consulting with and collect data from key stakeholders for use in our ongoing assessment of the economy's current employment situation. That way, the action of a job creation strategy we are developing in response to the evolving fundamentals of the job market will be in order. The strategy is a cocktail of the right policies, incentives, partnerships, and microfinance programs that will be applied strategically to produce the enabling environment for sustainable job creation and the productivity of marketable goods and services. Madam Speaker, it pains me to say this. 
but I must. One of the things depleting jobs for our people is the influx of expatriates who have no unique expertise. Although we already have laws prescribing this, the institutions mandated to enforce those laws have largely failed to do so. In many cases, we have expatriates doing things dissimilar to what they indicated on their first entry. As a nation, we must welcome experts from all over the world, but we must never allow our hospitality to be used in a way that disadvantages our own citizens. For that reason, my administration will ensure that only those expatriates with transferable skills we have in short supply are welcome to work within our borders. The point here is to ensure that what jobs we create for our citizens are not free, a free for all, for that defeats the purpose of this project. The same principle applies to issues of land. Madam Speaker, our land must, pro uh, must be protected and realized to benefit our people. With this understanding, my administration is rolling out land reforms which will be piloted in eight districts for study before the nationalization of the same. In addition, my administration is committed to reforming the management of land records through the land information management system and the decentralization of land administration to the district level. Madam Speaker, I want to be clear. The sale and acquisition of land by administration is fully aware of the various cases of land disputes and encroachment. And since we are committed to the rule of law, we will regulate security of land tenure to ensure that all individuals and entities with legal entitlement to land are protected and violators are brought to book. We have a similar crisis of lawlessness in relationship to housing. Uh, in relation to housing, well, my administration is aware of the acute shortage of housing for its citizens, especially in urban centers which some have taken as a license to break our country's housing laws with impunity. But the underlying problem is that demand is way higher than supply. According to the National Statistics Office, Malawi needs 21,000 new housing units every year. But we are far from meeting this demand because of the previous administration's lack of seriousness with the housing needs of Malawians. To address this gap, my administration is engaging various private sector players in the development of a robust housing program through public and private partnerships. In any case, one of the key issues this program is being designed to address is the chronic disenfranchisement of women and youth in matters of land and housing justice. This, Madam Speaker, brings me to considerations of matters related to the Minister of Youth and the Minister of Gender, Community Development and Social Welfare. Youth, Gender and Social Welfare. Malawi's population now stands at 17.5 million, of which 75% are youths and 51% are women. This means that empowering youth and women is key to unlocking the economic potential of Malawi as a whole. To achieve this, my administration will soon be launching the National Youth Service, as I promised, before I took office. But in the short term, we will train 3,000 youths in vocational livelihoods and technical skills, train 300 youths in business, provide startup tools and equipment to 600 youths, link 600 youths to financial lending institutions, engage 1,000 youths in entrepreneurial endeavors, 
and equipped the 5,000 youths with leadership skills. In support of this ambitious program, we will embark on a nationwide project to rehabilitate exi existing youth centers, build new sports centers, including the National Network Complex and a sports academy, as promised now in fest. Simultaneously, 800 school, co school coaches will be trained in various sports disciplines. Sports competitions in all disciplines will be revived at all levels. And 500 schools that teach physical education will receive support. Of course, my administration will provide special support to schools and school programs aimed at educating girls. For that is a key driver for advancing our Tulsa cause of gender equality. Madam Speaker, I'm determined to sustain the gains made towards gender equality with a view to making new ones. This budget, for example, includes funding for the formulation of women business groups, advocacy for implementation of gender quotas, dissemination of gender laws, development of report on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and the review of the National Plan of Action for Combating Gender-Based Violence. For the improvement of our children's welfare, my administration will implement child-friendly programs that will provide better opportunities for child development, protection, and participation. These include upgrading 150 community-based child care centers to child grows up in a vacuum. Therefore, to promote community development and functional literacy programs, my administration will continue building the capacity of local governance institutions at district council levels by training 1,200 village development committees, 2,000 project committees, and 600 extension workers. I'm particularly thrilled to announce the introduction of certificate level courses in community development and social protection at Magomero Community Development College and the Rwanda Community Development Training Center. This is on top of adult literacy classes we are also opening, which will enroll 400,000 learners. In the social cash transfer program, my administration is retargeting and increasing by 5% the number of beneficiaries. We are also increasing the amounts transferred to beneficiaries of the program from the current average of 7,000 kwacha per household per month to 9,000 kwacha, while the e-payment system will also be rolled out to more districts beyond Balaka and Sheo. Information. The ICT, Madam Speaker, the ICT sector comprises of three broad subsectors telecoms, broadcasting, and postal services. Our goal in telecoms is ensuring that by 2025, at least 80% of Malawians should have access to internet services and reap the digital dividends as per SADC's commitments. To facilitate this, we will reform MACRA into a people-centered professional regulator. In broadcasting, our aim is to break the spell of political civility that binds the Malay Broadcasting Cooperation, MBC. In the postal sector, my administration aims to make the Malai Post Corporation a profit-making enterprise through the digitization of postal services. Madam Speaker, all this will require reforming the Ministry of Information as a key policy driver in the ICT sector. The first signature reform in this regard will be a functional review to restructure the Department of E-Government, the National College of Information Technology, and the Department of Information. The second signature reform is operationalizing the Access to Information Act, which will take place in less than a month. State of the economy. 
Madam Speaker, at this point, the inevitable question rising in many people's minds is, what about the economy? Let me answer that question by looking at our economic performance over the last year, our economic prospects in the coming year, our macroeconomic framework, our infrastructure axis, our four key ministries for driving economic growth, and then a word about sustainable development goals. Economic performance. Madam Speaker, the growth of the economy measured by the gross domestic product, GDP, is projected to fall to 1.9% in 2020, following an initial estimate, uh, estimated growth rate of 5.5% for the year, compared to the 5.0% growth rate achieved in 2019. This is due to the impact of political uncertainty and instability occasioned by the elections of, 20, of May 2019, which triggered mass demonstrations countrywide. As you may recall, these developments occurred from the onset of the physical calendar in 2019 and continued up until the second quarter of 2020. In the middle of it all, the economy was hit by COVID-19 and the shock of local and global containment measures. Predictably, the inflation rate has been declining with headline inflation decelerating to an average of 8.9% in the second quarter of 2020, mainly due to the decline in food inflation after the improved maize production in the 2019-2020 agricultural season. Subdued industrial demand for maize due to COVID-19 restrictions, declining domestic fuel pump prices, and stable exchange rates also assisted in bringing down the inflation rate. And inflation is projected to average 9.8% for the year 2020 on account of lower growth projections. Madam Speaker, allow me to say a word about fiscal performance. The 2019-2020 fiscal year had a revenue of 1.527 trillion kwacha against a total expenditure of 1.841 trillion kwacha which means the year ended with an estimated deficit of 315 billion kwacha. This deficit was financed in large, by, in large part by domestic borrowing, which crowded out private sector uh, from assessing financial resources for product, productive prop purposes. Furthermore, there are arrears amounting to 169.4 billion kwacha, originating from unpaid, which the previous administration used to stifle private sector growth and the health of parastatal utility companies. It is therefore not surprising that unemployment in this country has reached an unacceptable levels. And that government has become the source of temporary jobs for fresh graduates in the form of internships. When private sector operators and utility parastatals are constrained in this fashion, they cannot expand. Neither can they create new businesses, which should ordinarily be the principal sources of sustainable jobs for fresh graduates. Madam Speaker, cumulative public debt has resulted in total public debt stock of 4.1 trillion kwacha as at the end of June 2020, which is 59% of normal GDP. Of major concern is that 57.3% of this total debt stock is domestic, representing 33% of GDP. In the past year alone, public debt increased by 430 billion kwacha. This position 
has resulted in interest charges reaching the region of 36.6% of GDP. In other words, for every 100 kwacha we generate, 36 kwacha 60 tambala is used to pay interest on the debt we have accumulated, excluding repayment of the actual loan. Madam Speaker, by the end of June 2020, the country's trade deficit stood at 887.98 million U.S. dollars, which is an, is an increase of 9.5 percent over the past year. What this means is that the country imported more goods and services than what we exported. by this amount. Uh, clearly, there have, been, there have not been appropriate policies to support the growth and diversification of exports. The foreign exchange that we use to import these goods and services almost exclusively came from donors in various forms at the expense of providing the necessary support to existing and potential exporters. The foreign exchange position at the end of June was adequate at 3.27 months of import cover, but this is hardly a consolation. Considering that the number of tourists visiting Malawi has dropped due to the international travel restrictions, we need greater cover. Economic prospects for the year 2020-2021. Madam Speaker, the success of Malawi's economy going forward will be anchored on solid institutional foundation. We will not tolerate corruption, nor will we interfere in the affairs of institutions fighting corruption. We will observe the rule of law in order to provide predict predictability of the political and economic environment. We will provide the necessary security to all residents, be they natural or corporate persons. We will empower institutions of economic governance to service the needs of investors and all manner of business people and the general populace. We will continuously carry out public sector reforms in order to reorient public officers' approach to work when offering service to the public. We will demand accountability by all public service position holders to get the maximum value from them. We will do this because we love our country and wish to restore confidence in our citizens, but also to give confidence to investors, both existing and prospective. My administration is aware that there are some investment opportunities that may appear to be high risk, and yet their returns to the economy are also high because they have potential for employment and new industry creation, new product generation, and technological upgrading. My administration will not hesitate to lead the way in such instances. In some cases, we will work alongside private sector, and in other cases, we will work alone as trailblazers without taking opportunities away from the private sector. This is what we mean by a developmental state. Macroeconomic framework. Madam Speaker, my administration will maintain macroeconomic, fiscal, and budget stability to not, to not nullify any hope of interference. Infrastructure access. Madam Speaker, following on from this, we will catalyze domestic and external economic integration through improved infrastructure development. Central to achieving this is providing electricity for industry and commercial uh, purposes, for industrial and commercial purposes, and road network to provide access to input and output markets. Currently, only 18 percent of Malawians have access to electricity while an estimated 80% of the country's roads remain unpaved. This travesty has been happening at a time the rest of the world 
is making phenomenal advances in transportation, especially rail, neglected by the previous administration to favor politically connected transporters. My administration is bringing rail back. <laughs> Our intervention to cut the power deficit will be to work with the Mozambican authorities to ensure that the deadline for connecting to their electricity grid in 2022 is not missed. Once this is done, Malawi will have access to the Southern Africa power pool, and in addition, we will resume construction of the country's 60 megawatt solar project and secure a strategic sponsor for the 350 megawatt Baramanga Hydro project. We are also concluding independent power producer agreements, which will open the sector to private investors, which will require new leadership at ESCOM to facilitate such reforms as new tariff structures that reflect market realities. We will, in addition, revisit many of the existing energy contracts and petroleum production sharing agreements in line with the law, ending those that are economically unsustainable and signed under questionable terms during the previous administration. In agriculture, Madam Speaker, agriculture has been the lifeblood of Malawi economy for a long time. The sector, however, can benefit dramatically from a series of reforms. It must become easy to trade within and across borders. Export restrictions without consultation must come to an end. The gazetting of the regulations under the New Control of Goods Act is a step in the right direction. We will put in place deliberate policies to make Ardmark functional again. Smallholder farmers, smallholder farmers must be able to export through corp corporations that aggregate their produce. Ardmark should be should be able to play a very fundamental role in this respect. <laughs> Productivity in the agricultural sector lags far behind when we consider that our 80% of the population engaged in the agricultural sector contributes only 30% of gross domestic product. Starting from this year, my administration will introduce the Affordable Inputs Program, AIP, through which about 4.3 million smallholder farmers will access affordable inputs including fertilizer at 4,495 kwacha per 50 kilogram bags. This will tremendously improve the level of productivity in this sector. Madam Speaker, while tobacco remains Malawi's primary export and a key form of income for many Malawians, the crop is unlikely to provide a sustainable source of income in the long term, longer term, given a decline in global demand. By working with tobacco companies, we can help blend other crop types into the farmer's mix over time. Diversification efforts such as this can contribute significantly to household food security while supporting the establishment will attest. We live in a truly remarkable country. From our beautiful game reserves to our magnificent lake, our country should not be kept hidden from the world. Rather, we should invite people from far and wide to experience what Malawi has to offer. This is because the generation of business and jobs are uh, on a large scale will require mass tourism. However, to successfully leverage tourism, we have to make Malawi an inviting destination. <laughs> this will involve the legislating of visa-free travel for tourists from high per capita GDP countries, encouraging private investment in the country's hospitality sector, securing agreements with commercial airlines so as to include them in their global networks, improving logistics and security in and around the country's airports, and training duty bearers 
to view and treat tourists with respect, courtesy, and care. <laughs> Complementing these developments, we will also need to drive up demand by targeting key markets, including the United States of America and Europe. Industry. Madam Speaker, Malawi needs to start moving towards industrializing itself for it to become a middle-income country by 2063. Industry conveys a lot of spillovers, including providing links to other sectors of the economy, such as agriculture. My administration will emphasize manufacturing as a base for transformation and creation of jobs or employment. I recently created uh, a separate ministry for industry to lead Malawi's industrialization efforts. Some of the specific projects designed to promote the industrialization agenda include establishment of special economic zones at Chigumula and Matindi Industrial Parks in Blanta, Area 55 in Lilongwe, Liwanda Dry Port in Machinga, and Cape Maclear Tourism Hub in Mangochi. The specific economic zones will a bill will be tabled here shortly, supplemented by the gazetting of the export processing zones regulations to operationalize the Export Processing Zones Act of 2013. Foreign Affairs. Madam Speaker, my administration recognizes that foreign relations have a significant role to play in promoting the socioeconomic development and growth of Malawi. In this regard, we will continue pursuing vibrant engagement with our immediate neighbors. And in the Southern Africa Development Community, SADC, the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, COMESA, the African Union, AU, and the United Nations, UN, at the global level. Due to challenges posed by COVID-19, we will participate in the 75th UN General Assembly in a virtual format. At the regional level, our focus is to integrate within the framework of SADC in the fields of trade and industry and in the maintenance of peace and security. My election as SADC incoming chairperson during the recently held meeting of SADC heads of state and government aligns with our priorities in international relations. We also intend to fully integrate ourselves within the African Union Agenda 2063, including such related programs as the African Continental Free Trade Area. We are also helping stabilize the region by participating in UN peacekeeping missions like the one our brave soldiers are part of in the Democratic Republic of Congo. By contrast, our focus on the world stage will be reforming the Foreign Affairs Ministry headquarters and its missions abroad so that our embassies are able to deliver on the ambitious objectives of promoting Malawi's national interest globally. The reforms will also include a review of our diplomatic presence, including our resolve to have new diplomatic missions in Lagos, Nigeria, and Jerusalem, Israel. I will be sharing more details about this in the near future. <laughs> the 2020-2021 budget framework. Madam Speaker, the 2020-2021 national budget will contribute to the achievement of the promises the Malawian people voted for. These include investment in infrastructure, provision of loans to an increased number of beneficiaries through the Malawi Enterprise Development Fund, MEDEF, and revitalizing farming through the Affordable Inputs Program, AIP, that will give farmers access to fertilizer. To achieve these policy objectives, the 2020-2021 national budget has been formulated to promote the following major outcomes. First, my administration will exercise strict fiscal discipline. This will require getting monthly expenditure reports from ministries, departments, and agencies of government for the previous months as a basis for additional funding. Since the previous administration left near empty coffers, huge domestic and external debts, and an insurmountable budget deficit, 
we must learn to do much with less. To make matters worse, the COVID-19 pandemic and its containment measures has hit taxpayers hard, leaving our revenue levels so low that we have to find creative ways to finance our planned activities. Second, my administration has allocated financial resources strategically by directing its spending according to its priorities and programs with the highest net economic and social benefits. Thirdly, my administration has allocated resources in such a way that there will be operational efficiency to enable government to produce and deliver services in a timely and cost-effective manner. Homeland Security and Defense. My administration is cognizant of the fact that national security is a prerequisite for the socioeconomic development of Malawi. It is only when Malawi is secure that investors, both foreign and local, can have the confidence to invest in this country. To show my commitment to internal security, I recently redeployed General Vincent Mimbre as commander of the Malawi Defense Force. But, but I will also be meeting the Defense Council soon to consider their recommendations towards greater security. The following are additional measures in the coming year to strengthen our military. One, rehabilitation and construction of houses and apartments for our men and women in uniform. Construction of the state-of-the-art military referral hospital in Area 35, Milan. Finalizing the rehabilitation of roads within Kobe Barracks in Zomba. Rehabilitation of Kobe Barracks office structures and formulation of the national service policy and the completion of the defense policy. Other security considerations high on my agenda include the humane custody of prisoners, management of refugees, and promotion of safe and orderly migration. The Malai Police Service, MPS, is key in this, but that means the historic abuse of its officers must end. The death of precious lives, both of, for civilians and officers, incidences of sexual violations, police, uh, physical uh, assault and use of excessive force over inmates, women and girls, within or outside police premises, which have been reported against police officers, create an environment that is unsafe for both police officers and citizens. To restore the dignity of the police uniform in the eyes of the public, my administration will fast track the implementation of the Malai Police Service Functional Review Report to address investigation, prosecution, and public order competency needs. During the 2019-2020 fiscal year, the prison services managed to successfully undertake a functional review, which will soon necessitate changing of the department from a prison service to a correctional service. This change will bring reforms such as the introduction of a parole system that allows well-behaved inmates to be released early. The department has also constructed 20 modern staff houses in Zomba, as well as a 120-bed cell block in Kota Kota, and a gazetted halfway house in Baraka. During the 2020-2021 fiscal year, my administration will continue ensuring that prison services meet international standards by, among others, expanding crop and livestock prison agriculture to ensure food sufficiency in our prisons, expanding mechanized irrigation farming in prison farms to ensure food sufficiency, constructing additional cell blocks in prisons to decongest them, and continuing rehabilitation vocational and correctional programs to ensure smooth reintegration of prisoners to their communities once released. In the Department of Immigration and Citizenship Services, 
the following achievements have been registered. Migration to the e-platform for its major operations to improve service delivery, joint border operations with Malai Police Service and Malai Defense Force to ensure that our borders are secure, and introduction of an e-passport with advanced security features. During the 2020-2021 fiscal year, the Department plans to operationalize the new dual citizenship bill, which will, or act rather, which will help create an enabling environment for investment, operationalize the new Immigration Act, and move the immigration headquarters from Blanta to Lilongwe to cut operational costs. Similarly, the National Registration Bureau will embark on a mass registration of all children below the age of 16 years to ensure that each of them has a birth certificate as a human right. Another human right issue may, my administration has been working on is the completion of the 2019-2020 functional review on the management of refugees culminating in the establishment of the Department of Refugees and the Ministry of Homeland Security, as well as the uh, development of the first ever national migration policy. Public sector reforms. The current public sector reforms agenda is housed within the presidency through the office of the vice president under the Ministry of Economic Planning and Public Sector Reforms. The Right Honorable Vice President has revived the reforms agenda through consultations with all government ministries, parastatals, and other constitutional bodies to identify the persistent challenges to efficiency and effectiveness. In the remainder of this year, the reforms will continue to implement the following major activities. One, enacting and developing reform laws and policies training all public servants on the Malawi National Public Sector Reforms Policy and the Malawi Public Se uh, Service Management Policy, and thirdly, initiating and implementing reforms in constitutional bodies. The goal of all this is the creation of a results-oriented, high-performing civil service by 2022 that facilitates positive transformation of the economy and the country's modernization. Local government and rural development. Madam Speaker, the Tosa government will continue to place integrated rural development and decentralization high on the national development agenda. I'm aware of the slow pace of decentralization experienced during the past administrations mainly due to lack of political will. But my administration has a clear timeline for the remaining sectors to devolve, all to be completed within the coming year. Similarly, I'm aware of the need to improve the human resource capacity in local councils, which we will address by recruiting qualified individuals. However, one hindrance to such recruitment is that most councils do not have a healthy working environment no less compounded by the fact that some councils are still using dilapidated buildings as offices. This is unacceptable. My administration will therefore construct district commissioners and civic offices <clears throat> in councils. We will also review the policies and systems related to the administration of local councils and the improvement of chiefs' welfare. The councils are critical stakeholders in our rural transformation and development agenda, for they are the epicenter of inclusive wealth creation in local communities. As such, we will continue with the development of rural growth centers, of rural growth centers. However, we will improve the current approach and format for rural growth centers to establish secondary cities that have such facilities as a commercial bank, AdMac Depot, Technical College, Secondary School, Youth Center, Village Industries, and processing plants, organized, <coughs> organized markets, and rural buses. To achieve this, I have directed the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development 
to work with the office of the vice president through the public sector reforms to develop a concept and budget for these cities. As far as I'm concerned, the true measure of our nation's development is not the mammoth project in our cities, but the lifted livelihoods of our villages. It is there in the rural parts of Malawi that my administration desires to build a new Malawi to inspire a generation of new Malawians. Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Madam Speaker, the world came together in 2015 in an unprecedented effort to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. The world agreed to end hunger, to end poverty, and that prevention and treatment of measles, malaria, and TB is possible. That we can break the cycle of poverty, and that our people can rise to prosperity, and that investment in public health can work. The SDGs, just like the African Union's Agenda 20, 2063, are detailed blueprints for delivering to our people the future they deserve. The ambitious goals represent real, tangible progress in the well-being of our people, reflected in improvements to health, economic opportunity, gender parity, and environmental protection. The National Planning Commission presented the Malawi Nation of Vulnerability uh, Voluntary Report in July 2020 at the United Nations High Level Political Forum to assess progress of SDGs to date. However, Malawi is not on track to meet the goals. There is some progress in 29, mainly in SDG 3, Good Health, and SDG 4, Education for All, while there is moderate progress on 59 targets and poor performance on 81 targets, especially ending poverty and gender equality. I have therefore prioritized the SDGs as integral to the attainment of our national development and achievement of our national priorities, some of which are stated in the Malawi Growth and Development Strategy. The National Development Conference which I officially opened on 27th August 2020 as a first step towards the National Transformation 2063 or NT 2063 demonstrates this commitment. It is our national roadmap, the transformation Malawi, uh, transforming Malawi into a middle income country by 2063. Madam Speaker and honorable members, I submit for your consideration this report on the Malawi people and their cause. Thank you for listening. God bless you and God bless Malawi. Makamaka Chagachi Nuja 2020, Kufijira to Chaka 2021. The Ugambo Gankulago and a photo was a good thing. A carriage of Mala, we remain at the Zigo, Losauka, Komadu Zigori, Silo Sauka. You are in a good Zigori, Lima Onega, Losauka, Fajoguti, Rinagita, Wasauki, Silo, and then Tuena, O Panda Jurungamo, Amene, Anna Liberabo, Zintunzina and Zina, and the boy you are where Kuzabangandi to restore. Restoring warmth to the heart of Africa. But you go Malawi, Lima Chulidwa do good in the warm heart of Africa. Come a mene manene raja guera gunena good to do. Couldn't have go in the Kufunda, go come warm heart of Africa, go kuna karanga di guajeberago, and then Kofunika Gambi, go up where it's a Kufunda, warm heart of Africa, Zigo Limeneri, Zigo La Malawi. He also an photo of Malawi, Amalawi, Amalawi, 
adoba ndi zindu zosiana siana a Malawi adoba kukhala mudziko lakatangale a Malawi akuti adoba kukhala ndi a uh, makoti amene sakupereka chitere sakupereka chirungamo a Malawi adoba kukhala munyumba zopanda magetsi a Malawi adoba ndi tu kumakhala ndi mipope ya madzi omwe madzi osati luka ndi ana kufota kwa zabo zinthu zosiana siana khani zake nkumatero iwo anena kuti ngofunika kwambiri kuti dziko la Malawi a Malawi ali yete ali kumbali makamaka bwone se plant a memorial tree at the VIP planting ndiye ana kunja kundikona kuti yai akula akulu akukonzekera ndithu kuti khoza malo amene ntsogolo watsiko lino akuyenera ndithu kudzatolesa po chithunzi ana kamba po zama gawambiri ati akuyera makamaka ofuna kuonesesa kuti zinthu zibwereso chimake ana kamba po ndithu nkhani zokhudzana ndi judiciary kuti kodi judiciary chofunika kuchitika ndi chani kuti judiciary iyende bwino lomwe 